All right, we're ready to go ahead and get started. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for any of you who are fellow West Coasters, and good afternoon for you folks who are joining me from the East Coast. Uh, my name is Skylar Perry. I'm the Director of Membership and Benchmarking here at IBI, and today I will be taking you through our uh, new industry reports that we just launched this week. Um, and basically, I'm going to be um, highlighting for each report some of the changes that we made this year. So I want to first uh, start off the webinar by acknowledging all the hard work that was done by our benchmark advisory group. Uh, the advisory group was comprised of uh, all of, uh, representatives from our data suppliers as well as um, some of what we would consider are, are really our super users of our, our benchmarking reports. So we convened a group and we spent a number of months uh, meeting to really go through uh, everything about the benchmarking reports from the data uh, collection instruments through the actual reports themselves, rebuilt both of those things, uh, tried to really uh, improve uh, the reporting, update them, make sure that we were providing metrics that were of value to the market at large and that folks would be able to uh, take out there and uh, and use with prospects and clients. So a big thank you to the Benchmarking Advisory Group, um, uh, whose hard work really made uh, this revision uh, possible this year. So thank you to those folks. Um, now we're going to go ahead and, and get started here. We are currently, um, you should be viewing uh, ibilove.org, the IBI website, and just really briefly in terms of accessing the benchmarking reports if you have uh, never uh, had any interaction with the IBI benchmarking reports, we'll just go ahead and start here um, from our homepage, which is again IBIweb.org. Under the tools section, you will head to the benchmarking subsection. You're going to want to make sure that you are logged in to your account. If you are not logged in, you will not see the report builder here on the right hand side of your screen. That will just be blank. Um, if you don't yet have a login and password for the website, under the membership tab, there is an area where you can submit a website login request. So uh, if you're on the call, if you're interested in the reports and you don't have access yet, uh, please do go ahead and request a website login. These are each uh, provided at the individual basis rather than the company basis, so uh, we encourage everyone to have their own login rather than sharing. So do take advantage of that if you don't have a login yet. Once you're on the benchmarking site, uh, it's pretty simple in terms of generating the reports. Everything is done via, via drop-down menus and radio buttons. So that you begin by selecting the year. Uh, we always keep three years' worth of data online, um, industry summary reports, and then you're going to select a program of interest. Of course, we cover uh, short and long-term disability, workers' comp, and uh, federal FMLA. Select your program. Select a general area of interest, so this is going to be the one-digit SIC code for the industry that you're particularly interested in. Um, we'll just say manufacturing. And then it, go, it will bring up the report builder down here. You can select to receive your report in either PDF or Excel format. So if you're really just looking to grab a couple numbers from a report to incorporate into your own presentation, that Excel format is going to be the way you want to go. But we also provide a, a slicker-looking PDF uh, if you're going to be using the, the whole report itself. Select the industry or industries that you would like to grab the report for and hit the download button. So very simple report interface. I just wanted to uh, quickly touch on that before we actually dive into the content of the reports themselves. Um, and feel free, again, to uh, follow up with me with any questions afterwards if, you, uh, if there's any confusion about how you access the data. So we're going to start with our short-term disability reports. I'm going to take you through one of our new reports and uh, highlight some of the new features that we've integrated after our review this year. So for our uh, our example here, I'm looking at SIC 80, which is the SIC code for health services. And I'm going to actually zoom in a little bit here so you can see things a little bit more clearly. So um, similar to past years, we've kept the format of the metrics results tables the same. You have your group average or mean value. You have your median or 50th percentile value. And then you have your 10th, 25th, 75th, and 90th percentile values. We'll tell you the number of employers that were used in any calculation and the number of claims that went into any calculation as well. Uh, most folks are going to focus here on the average just because that's what's familiar. That's what what most people are comfortable with, but I would encourage you to take advantage of the percentile values as well to give you a, a more specific comparison point when uh, looking at a client or prospect's results. Uh, our first section of metrics here focus on claim incidents. We did not add any metrics here in the claim incidents section. Second section focuses on claim payments, and we actually 
uh, removed a, a, a metric here that was folks indicated was not particularly useful. Third section is around duration. We did add a metric here for uh, duration. Uh, we previously have always had calendar year lost workdays per 100 covered lives, so that is paid lost workdays. But folks indicated that they really wanted to know the total lost workdays per 100 covered lives, so including that elimination period uh, and the weekends. So we uh, integrated this metric into the reporting for the first time this year, calendar year lost calendar days per 100 covered lives, so that folks can really get a sense of the, the total number of calendar days they have uh, missing uh, and then scale it to their uh, employee population size. And then a number of other duration measures here, which fall along with what we've done uh, in the 2015 reports. Finally here, we uh, examine what happens to claims at the end of their life cycle. So claims that reach the maximum benefit duration and claims uh, that are converted over to uh, L the LTD system. So now we'll actually get into some stuff uh, that looks a little bit different here. This is pretty much the same. We have still our nine basic plan types uh, based on elimination period and maximum duration of benefits. This section of the report, we tell you about how uh, prevalent each of these plan types are uh, in our data, just so you get a sense of really how common these are in terms of both this industry and all industries within our database. And here's where things have changed a little bit. So for our plan type reporting before, uh, the format was not particularly readable. It wasn't um, as specific as folks would like. One thing that we've heard for a number of years is that we want to start to include and incorporate uh, additional plan uh, elements other than just elimination period and maximum benefit duration. So one thing that's always been a focus for folks is the wage replacement rate. Um, you know, when, we're, when we contemplated how we were going to integrate that into the reporting, um, you know, splitting every plan out by every wage replacement rate and reporting results for each of those uh, didn't make a lot of sense in a static PDF report. So we, we wanted to come up with a way that we could incorporate some information about the wage replacement rate and how common some of these plans were. So this is what we came up with. So for plan type A, we're going to cover these wage, repla ten, uh, these wage replacement rate bands. They are essentially 10 percentage point bands. And we're going to tell you the percentage of claims uh, in this plan type that fall into this wage replacement rate. So really, again, this is kind of contextual information, giving you additional information around um, in this plan type, how common are these wage replacement rates? Really not surprisingly here in plan A, 65% of all claims fall under a 61 to 70% wage replacement rate. That's pretty standard. We also have a, a pretty large chunk up here at 91 to 100. So those uh, kind of wage continuation plans are relatively popular here for plan type A as well. Uh, this is new also uh, for each of the plan types we are reporting out five of the uh, most commonly used uh, claim metrics, so payments per closed claim, lost calendar days per closed claim, lost calendar days per closed claim, excluding those pregnancy claims, and then claims reaching the maximum benefit duration and percentage of closed claims converted to LTD. And obviously, the maximum benefit duration uh, metric is particularly um, relevant when you're looking at different plan types to kind of get a sense of, um, you know, how is the, the plan, uh, how is the plan design affecting how many of these folks are, are reaching that maximum benefit duration. So we provide this same page breaking out the plan results in STD for our nine different plan types. And I will not repeat all of that for each one. And now we get to the condition-specific section. So we have, for the last number of years, had a condition-specific uh, section of the reporting, but we've uh, really added a whole lot. So um, I apologize if it, it looks perhaps a little bit um, uh, crowded with all the new columns, but I think it provides some really great additional information and detail. So these are uh, the ICD-9 major diagnostic categories here on the left. Uh, soon this is going to be probably be in the next uh, year or two years, we're going to be moving over to ICD-10, but we're still in kind of that transition in terms of the data we receive. Um, so previously on our condition-specific reporting, we've had these three columns, percentage of closed claims, percentage of payments for closed claims, and lost calendar days per closed claim. So those three things were always present in our reporting. But as you can see, we've added a number of other um, uh, pieces of information for each diagnostic category to give you um, some more specific results. So you get a chance to see the percentage of new claims rather than just the percentage of closed claims. Obviously, in short-term disability, this is going to be you know, relatively close. We provide the lost work days per closed claim. And again, those are paid lost work days as opposed to those calendar days, um, but a another duration measure there. Payments per closed claim, so you can see which of those uh, claim those uh, diagnostic categories are driving really costly claims. Claims reaching maximum benefit duration as a percentage of closed claims and the percentage of closed claims converted to 
LTD. All of the values that you see here, these are all average values, these are all average metric values for each of the major diagnostic categories on the left. And then we tell you about how many claims um, went into each, uh, uh, went into the calculations that you see here on the page. So how many claims do we have for each of these diagnostic categories? So somewhat similar to what we've done in the past, but we added a whole bunch of new information for each of the diagnostic categories here. And now this is entirely new. We've created a second page of the condition-specific report, and this really deals with claimant demographics. So for each of the MDCs, we are now breaking out this, the, uh, we're splitting out the breakdown between male and female claimants, um, and then claimants by age band. So we've got uh, 20 to 30, or 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, and 60 to 69. So you can really get a much more specific sense of, um, you know, which uh, which uh, diagnostic categories are driving claims, and then also for those claims, what does the claimant profile look like? So are you mostly seeing male versus female? Are you mostly seeing claimants, younger claimants versus older claimants? So um, just really gives you a, a far more specific. Um, a comparison point for all the diagnostic categories and what's really uh, perhaps driving um, uh, short-term disability claims and lost time within a workforce. Um, so again, just kind of a good reference point, some additional uh, contextual information. And then we get to our glossary, which we've revised this year just to update it and make sure that we are being clear on the terms we are using. And that is the end of the report. We actually uh, took out a, a bit of uh, the metric calculation section that, that folks indicated wasn't particularly useful here. So we are still keeping the glossary so you're clear on what we're doing, um, and that wraps up the short-term disability report. So now I'll go ahead and move over to our long-term disability reporting here. For this, we're looking at manufacturing, SIC code D. So uh, the LTD reporting, we uh, made some more significant changes to the metrics that we have been looking at. So STD, we only really added one metric um, in terms of the main metric section of the report. For here for LTD, we've made some uh, kind of additional changes, and we, we really focused on figuring out how we could make our LTD reports more meaningful for the market. So um, you'll still see new claims per 1,000 covered lives. That's exactly what we used to do. Um, previously, we've always had an active claims metric, and active claims, for those of you who aren't familiar in terms of when IBI is talking about it, is um, all of the new claims in a year plus all of the um, carryover claims. So basically, any claims that were, had begun in previous years that were still carrying into the current year. The problem in LTD is when you're looking at active claims because they have these really long-tailed claims and you have some claims that can go on for years or even decades, the active claim measure really wasn't valuable anymore. We ended up with these astronomical values that weren't really telling uh, the user anything about the industry. So we worked with our advisory group and we were trying to determine well, what's the best way to uh, look at some of these LTD results. And so what we came up with was looking at a 24-month band for claims. So not, we can look at all claims, of course, for some of these metrics, but we're also going to look at claims that fall within a two-year period. So in this sense, now you have active claims less than 24 months old per 1,000 covered lives. You've got all the new claims plus any other carryover claims that are two years old or less. So kind of a bit of a more meaningful way to um, look at the active claim population for any uh, employer within this industry. So rather than looking at all those long tail claims, we're really focusing in on kind of a two-year block there. New claims for closed claim, again, a holdover metric. Same with payments for active claim. We added... Um, uh, payments per covered life this year. That was something that a lot of folks expressed interest in in the advisory group, cut payments per closed claim. And then these three metrics here are entirely new. And this was something that took uh, a lot of thought and a lot of work to determine exactly how we wanted to uh, report these pieces of information and then really, of course, gathering all the data to support these measures. So the first is claims for which SSDI was awarded as a percentage of active claims. So again, all claims essentially. Claimants returning to work as a percentage of closed claims. So how many folks actually come back when their LTD claim closes versus, for example, exit the workforce? And then claimants returning to work as a percentage of closed claims less than 24 months old. So again, looking at that, that two-year uh, claim bucket. So of claims that close in LTD claims that close in two years or less, what percentage of those folks are actually making it back to work rather than uh, exiting the workforce? So uh, some different measures, really different than anything we've ever done in the past. But things that our, our advisory group really indicated would be uh, meaningful and valuable for them. 
plan type reporting for LTD uh, definitely got a big change. So now, rather than uh, how we had traditionally broken up plan types for LTD, we are just looking at combinations of elimination period and wage replacement rate. So um, a little bit different than our previous focus, but we're again trying to incorporate that wage replacement rate focus. And we are reporting um, four metrics here for each of these combinations. Paint calendar year payments for active claims, our SSDI awarded metric, returning to work as a percentage of closed claims, and returning to work as a percentage of closed claims less than 24 months old. So we're reporting those for each combination of elimination period and wage replacement rate where the data support uh, reporting those measures. Condition specific section, we've again added some new information. Um, in our previous iterations of our LTD reports, just like our STD reports, we would focus on percentage of closed claims and percentage of payments for closed claims. But for LTD, that was really not a great way to go because LTD, um, so few, relatively so few claims close within any given calendar year that the percentage of closed claims and percentage of payments for closed claims were never particularly well populated. Uh, we were finding that we just were dropping far too much data and it just wasn't very meaningful for our users. So we switched over to focusing on new LTD claims. So now we're looking at what's driving new LTD claims in any given year and which are those, uh, for, of all those new claims, which are the, the diagnostics categories that are really driving those claim costs as well. And then, uh, again, those three metrics we saw in the plan type section, payments for active claim, and then uh, returning to work and returning to work for those claims less than 24 months old. So we're reporting that for each of the diagnostic categories. And we, uh, this section of the diagnostic category uh, groupings, we report the very same thing that we do in short-term disability. So just breaking down some of those claimant demographics so you have a better sense of uh, when you're looking at these LTD uh, claims uh, for an employer, for an industry, you know, uh, what would you really expect to see in terms of uh, what kinds of employees are really driving these LTD claims? Do they skew older? Do they skew more male or female? So we're providing that additional contextual information there for LTD as well. And then, again, simply the glossary. So we're going to move on over to our FMLA reporting. And for this, I again use health services. SSC code 80 is our example. So this is a, an area where we made a lot of revisions. In a lot of ways, we kind of started um, from scratch with our FMLA reporting and kind of worked from there. So uh, we had already, always reported FMLA leaves on essentially an active leave basis, meaning um, we weren't just focusing on new leaves that started during a calendar year, just given the way that certifications work, it made more sense to look at kind of that total active leave population. But what we found was when we were talking to our advisory group, um, some folks felt that it was important to also get that new leave perspective as well incorporated into our reporting. So this year, we now, for every one of our um, our leave incidence measures, we include two versions, a new leave incidence measure and an active leave incidence measure. So uh, kind of giving both perspectives there, really trying to serve both audiences uh, and, and really uh, helping folks, uh, m making these more usable for folks and more valuable for people. So we're kind of uh, also visually split out some of our groupings to make it more apparent for users how we're combining things. So you have kind of a total leave uh, incidence measure up top, and then we're kind of breaking that down into two separate ideas, concurrent leaves and standalone leaves. And again, we have new concurrent and active and new standalone and active standalone incidence measures for you there. Uh, this year, another thing that we did was we had previously always just uh, broken out leaves into intermittent or continuous leaves. And we didn't break reduced schedule leaves out separately, but we, the feedback we received was that it was important for people to be able to talk uh, specifically to reduced schedule leaves as well. So we've now broken those out, so we break it down into intermittent, reduced schedule, and continuous leaves. So kind of three dimensions there instead of just the two dimensions that we had previously been using in our reporting. Denied leave requests per 100 stayed exactly the same as last year. Uh, and now we move on to breaking out what is dry, what conditions or what types of leave are, are driving FMLA incidents within an industry. So uh, this is another place where we made some changes. Previously, we had only had three leave categories. Uh, those three were own health condition, maternity or bonding, and care for a family member. Uh, and now we've actually expanded that a little bit. We still have our own health condition. We've now broken out maternity or bonding with a child into female and male uh, leave takers. Some folks really wanted to be able to break that down and see, uh, you know, how many of those bonding leaves were actually being taken by um, uh, by male folks instead of females. 
still have percentage of leaves for care for a family member, and now we've also added percentage of leaves for military service. So this is another thing that um, folks indicated was useful to them, and especially in certain um, parts of the country, certain industries, this is a really relevant metric um, for folks who are uh, leaving to do military service. So we wanted to make sure we incorporated that perspective as well. For our duration metrics, we follow a kind of a similar pattern in terms of breaking them out into the same areas that we did before, lost work days overall, concurrent versus standalone, intermittent, reduced schedule, and continuous. So again, incorporating those reduced schedule leaves. And now this is something wholly different than what we've done before. So we've always reported um, duration information just simply on a per leave basis. But folks indicated that they wanted to be able to look at when they're working with an employer, uh, they wanted to be able to look at um, uh, over the course, uh, they wanted a, a metric that you could scale to uh, the population size of an employer and, and have some valid information there. So we're also looking at uh, lost time on a per 100 eligible employee basis across all of the same categories uh, that we had previously uh, showed you in the report. So overall, breaking it down by uh, intermittent, reduced, and continuous, breaking it down by concurrent and standalone. And then here's something that, that's really different for us. We're also breaking it down by leave reason. So lost work days per 100 eligible employees broken out by each of the five leave reason categories uh, that we are now using. So own health, maternity bonding, both male and female takers, care for a family member, and military service. So really trying to provide some additional information that folks can use as a better comparison point um, when they're working with uh, their current uh, clients and or prospects and helping them understand what FMLA leave looks like in their industry and, and maybe understanding where they um, are in comparison there on FMLA. Now, another big section that we added this year is looking at results by state. So we always collected uh, information on claimant location at the state level. Uh, so we wanted to incorporate, begin to incorporate that information here in our FMLA reporting. It's particularly relevant for FMLA, um, though certainly we, it's relevant for other programs as well, but, but certainly particularly relevant here. Uh, we break out some of our duration metrics for each state. Um, this is an area where uh, we will probably uh, likely expand in the future as additional data become available around uh, some claim incidence measures. But for our kind of our first pass here this year, we managed to get in uh, at least duration measures by state, um, which some folks had, had asked for and indicated was going to be valuable for their work. And then simply our glossary here at the end of the report. And now finally, the fourth report that I'm going to take you through here is our workers' compensation reports. Uh, these actually did not particularly uh, change a lot, but these were uh, uh, reports that we launched last year in a really different format than anything we've done in the past, and so I still wanted to make sure to touch on them. These were reports that perhaps not a lot of folks were uh, really aware of last year, but I think it's something um, pretty unique and something different that we've done that is really different from our other programs. So I wanted to take a moment to talk to these as well. So uh, in all of our other reporting, we have focused on a single reporting year. So um, you know, STD, we're looking at what happened to claims in 2016. Well, what we found in working with our report users uh, was that workers' comp reporting on that basis, on just that uh, calendar year, single year um, basis, was not really very useful. Uh, folks really needed to, uh, when they're looking at workers' comp, they really needed to see how these claims were aging over time. They really needed a, an expanded view of what was happening. So we took that to heart. We went back to the drawing board, and we um, began requesting essentially six-year blocks of data from our workers' comp data suppliers. So rather than just focusing on uh, claims that had a loss year of 2016, these reports look back across all claims that had a loss year of 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, or 16. Um, and just to make it clear, this is all claims across all those years regardless of when they closed. So if a claim had a loss year of 2011 and closed in 2012, that would still be included here. This is not just focusing on 2016, we're focusing on all six years. We provide here in our workers' comp reporting for each year a breakdown of medical-only versus indemnity claims, and we give you the claim numbers there as well. We provide claim closure information. So this is something that folks indicated was valuable to them, was to be able to look at. In this case, we created six-month buckets, so you can look at uh, where are claims closing for each loss year? So back here in 2011, you have 88% closing within six months, et cetera, et cetera, all the way out to between 54 and 60 months. So essentially all the way out to five years. You can see, you know, when are claims really closing uh, in workers' comp? 
And then we, uh, we've we included a number of metrics. Each subsequent page of the report will look very similar to this. We have those same six-month buckets uh, for claim closure, and now we're reporting for claims in each loss year, um, the average paid per claim for those that close within six months, between 6 and 12, 12 and 18, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're also providing you a visual representation of what that data looked like. So you can go ahead and see um, how, how the uh, costs are, are growing over time and how one loss year might be different from, an os- from another loss year or how they may be you know, very similar. And we follow that same uh, structure throughout the, the rest of the report. We're looking at things like, of course, paid and incurred expenses, prescription drug payments, legal fees, TTD payments, uh, and TTD days per claim. So um, a really different look for IBI here in our workers' comp reporting. It's different from our other programs, but we really felt like it was um, uh, in the spirit of being responsive to what our members indicated that they needed to actually, uh, you know, take our reports out there in the field and and really derive value from them. So we really switched to this essentially six-year focus, and this is the way that we'll be uh, reporting workers' comp moving forward. And so that's the end of our four new reports. Um, I covered essentially kind of highlights for each report, dove a little bit into uh, what makes the report different from the 2015 iteration of the same, uh, the same program, the report for the same program. So now I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone, uh, and we'll spend uh, however long you would like to um, asking questions, and I'll go ahead and, and provide all the answers I can. So I'm going to unmute everyone here. All right, so now I'll go ahead and take any questions that that anyone would like to raise. If you're not comfortable raising a question now, please feel free. I have my contact information up here on the screen. Uh, Don't hesitate to reach out to me via email or phone. I'm I'm happy to answer questions offline as well, but I will open it up now for uh, any questions from the audience. 